Well, welcome to Spread Homeschool Conversations. Um, our topic tonight is um, reading, decoding, fluency, and comprehension. And our special guest tonight is Heather Walton from A Plus Education Solutions. And um, I just want to thank all of you who are joining us live. And for those of you that are watching on our YouTube video or maybe on the recorded session on Facebook or on our, listening on our podcast, um, just know if you are watching live that you can interact with us as we're going along through this conversation and talking about this subject. And you can put your questions right in the Facebook feed and we will um, get to those as we're conversing in this next hour. But um, just welcome, Heather. Thank you for um, taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. This is a, a great topic. I um, I read somewhere once that the highest points of anxiety for parents when they're homeschooling is when they teach children to read and when they start high school. And we hear a lot of those questions. And so as we're starting a new homeschool year, this is an incredible subject to um, to dive into because I'm sure there's a lot of parents out there who have apprehensions, which I hear that you have a bit of a story based on, you know, your own struggles in, in teaching reading to your, your own children. So I thought maybe you could start out by um, sharing a little bit of that story with us. And then I know you have a lot of information that we'll get into in just a minute. Yes. Um, well, when I was first homeschooling quite a few years ago with my oldest two daughters and my oldest daughter really did struggle with learning mm -hmm. to read. And, you know, I, First, it just seemed like there might have been something wrong with me or my approach. I think I tried five different highly recommended homeschool curriculums. And but I did read this book called Better, uh, Better Late Than Early. Oh, and yes. it was very um, helpful to me. And so it was the one thing maybe kept me from losing my cool and sending her off to school right away. Mm -hmm. And uh, it said, you know, that sometimes all of the components necessary for reading don't come together until age nine. And um, after laying all that groundwork from age five to nine, she started reading the week of her ninth birthday. And so, and actually ended up being able to do AP English um, in high school. So mm -hmm. there was a happy ending, but um, it was very difficult in for both of us in the process. Many, sh many tears were shared by both of us. And uh -huh. that was before I really, I, I was very self-educated on reading um, just because I had tried to learn as much as I could about it, but it was before mm -hmm. I had went and gotten any kind of education for learning disabilities or challenges. Mm -hmm. Our kids kind of force us into, uh, into learning more than we ever expected we would learn <laughs> because they come with their unique challenges. And I'm sure because since you have more than one child that um, mm -hmm. you've, you've approached reading from, from many different angles and you have a lot of experience to share with us tonight. Yes. So, um, so what, you want to talk a little bit about, you know, setting up your child for the best introduction. So for parents who have kids on the early end, you know, maybe that, that formalized education isn't, isn't maybe something that they even are working on yet. What can they do ahead of that? Right. Well, first thing is read, 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 read to your children and read them good quality books um, and read some more. Mm. You know, that is the biggest thing that you can do for your children, no matter how old they are, is to read aloud to them. Because when you read aloud, you're you're modeling good reading to them and you're modeling those patterns of inflection and all those kinds of things mm -hmm. to them. And you're also showing them that reading is valuable. It's something that they really should mm -hmm. want to go after. I know my little one-year-old will get out a book and she'll start reading to herself because she sees and hears everybody else reading. Mm -hmm. So that would be the very, that would be the very first thing that I would say and all the way through. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as you move on, there are other things, but as in the preschool years, just read a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think that we, you know, all the way through high school, we even did read out louds and, you know, audio mm -hmm. books and those types of things. Hearing other people read really does affect your own reading. Um, it does. So that's some great advice. Um, so what is the first component that you should really start with when you're teaching a child on how to read? What, what are the basics or the essentials that you should focus mm -hmm. on? 
Well, the first thing you want to focus on is phonological awareness, which you may or may not actually have to teach directly. Mm -hmm. But if you start off and trying to read and they don't catch on, it could be because they don't have phonological awareness. And what phonological awareness is essentially is, are you hearing words the way they actually sound and mm -hmm. can a child break apart a word can they put it back together sound by sound so for example if the word is cat can they can they tell you that it's k a t hmm. okay or mm -hmm. can they if you say k a t can they say cat can they produce that word from it if they can't yeah. hear those sounds those individual sounds even if they can't tell you what letters they are but mm -hmm. if they can't that's not a big deal it's the sounds. If they don't hear those sounds correctly, then they're not ready to start reading instruction. That's a good pointer because I think mm -hmm. parents will will really push that. And so you're saying just hold off until right. they can really get to those those basics and, and really understand the, the differentiation. I think we kind of beat our heads against the wall when, when we choose to, to continue teaching things beyond where, where they're um, ready to, to learn. So that's a... A good uh, good way to look at it. So what about the difference between phonics and whole word reading? I know there's <laughs> there, there seems to be phases, you know, that the school systems go through and, and even in, in the homeschool realms in talking about um, phonics versus whole word, word reading. So what, what are the differences? What are the pluses, the minuses and um, any information you have to share with parents about those two approaches? Oh, might have lost a feed here. But hopefully her internet will come back soon. Um, I know she had some really good information to share with us. So, um, oops, and now we lost her for a second here. Um, hopefully she'll be able to come back in. So um, if you have any questions to, to ask Heather um, while we're waiting for her um, feed to come back, um, definitely let me know and um, put those in the comments and hopefully we'll be able to add her in very soon. But um, I don't know if any of you have had experience with um, the whole word reading um, phonics or even knew about it before you started homeschooling. I have to tell you from my experience, I didn't know anything. <laughs> I, I was taught whole word reading. I didn't know something that like phonics ever existed until I first started homeschooling. And um, that was a real wake up call for me because I thought people just learned how to read on their own and it wasn't something that you really had to teach because um, I don't remember ever being taught to read. Um, so, so it was frustrating, especially since my oldest was a huge struggling reader and didn't read until he was 11. And so it um, looks like Heather might be back here. I'm gonna add her back to the broadcast and um, and we'll continue on where we left off. <laughs> Welcome I back. Don't know. Looks like a technical glitch. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no, that's that's just fine. I'm glad we have the ability to add you back in. There's some broadcasts that are set up that haven't. So we were on the topic of phonics versus whole word world word that <laughs> whole word reading and just the differences the pluses and minuses of both and so definitely want to get your your feedback on that yes um so you know there's people who say oh you need to use phonics and some people who say you need to use whole language and whole language is a big movement i think in the 90s mm -hmm. um i definitely would discourage whole language learning if your child can learn with phonics and mm -hmm. i haven't met a child yet who can't I'm not saying that there that that child doesn't exist but I have worked with a lot of students and have found that a lot of times any issues that they have is because they don't have that remedial phonics base mm. um, so but with that said you can't learn everything by phonics because a lot of our mm -hmm. uh, words don't operate phonetically and so it has to be a combination of learning some sight words along with learning phonics mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but whole language learning, trying to learn every word in and of itself is exhausting. And mm -hmm. so, and it requires so much memory work that it would be, I can't even imagine trying to teach mm -hmm. it that way. Phonics is the basis of our language for the most part. And so it is definitely the way to go in teaching. 
Yeah. So we have a question here from Yvonne. She she asks, um, going back to the previous topic that we were talking about, final mm -hmm. funnel awareness. And she says, what are some of the best games or playful ways to teach that to your child? Yes. So there are um, some different ways that you can do this. You can just make it a game and say, let's mm -hmm. take apart this word and let's put it back together and those kinds of things. But you can also do things with games. There are a lot of rhyming games that you can mm -hmm. purchase or you can create. Um, and so that's one way. Rhyme, onset and rhyme is one por portion of that. It's not the whole thing. But, you know, there's all kinds of rhyming games out there. There are, um, you know, you can take, there is a website, uh, Florida Center for Reading Research, which is fcrr.org. Yeah, you had shared that with me. I can bring that up on our screen. And yes, here. and they have a, a whole bunch of basically center activities that in a classroom you would make centers from them. So there's a, um, it says, um, I can't see it though, but at any rate, there's a portion that talks about resources or tools. Yeah. And then when you go under there, it says, um, I believe it says center activities or student activities. Yeah, um, center activities. Yes. And so if you go um, to the K through one, it has um, a section on the first, the very top section, I think, underneath the teacher reference mm -hmm. is the phonological awareness. So there's all kinds and that's all free. You just print it up and cut it out or laminate it, put it on cardstock and you've got games there that you can play. Um, and awesome yes, it absolutely is. Um, and it's got things for all the way up through fifth grade. <laughs> so, um, but that is where you would find a lot of the phonological awareness things. Um, you can go around just, you know, with things in your house, you know, they, you're at the table, table, what sound does that start with? T -t -t -t, you know, and play mm -hmm. games like that. Um, younger kids will definitely be good with that. Now, if you've got an older kid that doesn't have phonological awareness, they're probably not going to be as excited about that. <laughs> and it may be harder to make it a game. It might just have to be an academic exercise for them. Mm -hmm. Or something that gets a reward at the end. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. Great. Well, well, thanks so much, Yvonne, for that that question. That was definitely um, a good resource to, to have shared. Um, mm -hmm. So, so what are I know you talked about there. There's other ways that you can um, work on training exercises for for building words. Um, mm -hmm. So you had mentioned like air writing. Um, yeah. So. Phonics, there's a lot of tools for teaching phonics and um, you definitely want to use, okay, if you have a kid who's not struggling, you can probably just use the workbooks and the traditional approach to phonics mm -hmm. and, and get it all figured out in a year or two, right? But if you have a kid that's struggling, that's probably not going to be the case. And mm -hmm. so you want to use a multi-sensory approach and a multi-sensory approach is not going to hurt any child um, whether they struggle or not mm -hmm. um, so a multi-sensory approach is great there are a lot of great programs that work and then there's strategies that work within those programs or exclusive of those programs so some strategies would be things like air writing so if you're writing a if you're using the word cat they can look up at their finger Okay, look at the fingernail and out the right corner of their eye and they can write it in the air saying k a t cat. Um, and that is supposed to get get that visualized in their mind so that they have a symbol imagery is what it's called. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's one strategy. And mm -hmm. you also I like to have kids write on textures. So you might get a piece of burlap like the stuff that they sell for the on a spool so for cute. weddings and stuff <laughs> like that you know um you get um something like that or you might have something textured even the carpet mm -hmm. just something mm -hmm. that has a texture and you have them write on that texture and the reason it it makes a difference too with writing with their finger as opposed to writing with a pencil is it's mm -hmm. sending a different message to the brain and oh, you know yes and so and by the way writing with a pencil is better than writing with a pen is 
which is better than writing with um, a dry erase marker. Writing with chalk would be better than writing with a dry erase marker because the more resistance mm -hmm. you have when you're writing, the more it's going to send messages to your brain as well. So those are a couple strategies. Um, also, you want to look at, um, you know, making the lessons short because sometimes, yeah. especially if it's something a child struggles with, having a really long drawn out lesson is going to be um, a little bit challenging for them and they're going to get tired. But even if you are like I tutor children and I typically don't tutor for phonics for more than 45 minutes, mm -hmm. but I have a variety of activities within that 45 minutes. So we're not just sitting there trying to sound out words for 45 minutes. That's a good um, point. Yes. Just we're changing around. it up quite a bit. Yeah. Just change it up. Even if you're working on the same subject, just approach it different ways. So the child doesn't feel exhausted. Right. Good point. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, so those are, you know, anytime you can put more senses into it. So if they're spelling it out loud, writing it in the air on a texture, um, they're looking at it, you know, as many of the senses as you can engage as possible. If you have them moving at the same time, that's even more, you know, just mm -hmm. as many of the senses as you possibly can engage at the same time. Right. I, I found that, you know, even just having posters in our house or, you know, like the timeline stuff that my kids mm -hmm. were learning constantly when they walked through our school room, which happened to be my dining room. Um, but they they just absorbed that information because it was written and they looked at it all the time. And so, exactly. um, so don't discount just putting up lists <laughs> of what their mm -hmm. spelling words are, or what they're working on reading. Right. Um, they learn constantly. Yeah. And you can even do something like labeling things in your house. Mm -hmm. So with the, you know, with the words and then, you know, they get, it does kind of teach them sight words. Um, you know, if they, if everything's labeled, not, maybe not everything, but if many, yeah. as many things as you can are labeled, <laughs> or then the family uh, can, can deal with. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Well, those are some good pointers. Um, so what about fluency? You know, you had talked about when we talked about phonological awareness that mm -hmm. when you're reading out loud to a child or those first components, those setting up components, um, that how you read is how your child mimics. And mm. I, I love that because um, I never even really thought about that, but I would always make playful voices and, you know, and mm. try to, to make it engaging so that my children, mm. you know, felt like it wasn't just words on the paper. Um, but how do you help a child develop that fluency for themselves? Well, you know, in order to do, to get fluent, they have to do a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. So, and they have to do reading of things that are on their level. So if you are, you know, you're always going to be introducing new material to stretch them, but you're not going to want to introduce more than one concept mm -hmm. in a session. So, you know, you're going to want to be recapping all those things that they've already learned. And so one of those things, one of the a good strategy for fluency is repeated reading. So if you're having them read a book, then have them, I, sometimes I have kids read that same book back to me in the same session, like the first time they're mm -hmm. sounding everything out and they're kind of struggling with it. And then the second time through, they're reading it a lot better. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. if it's a really long book, they're not going to be reading the whole thing. But, you know, I like to use like the Bob books and the little readers mm -hmm. and then also, mm -hmm. you know, short passages. And so they might struggle through it the first time, but I'll have them read it again. And then I might have them read it again the next time that I have a session. Hmm. So, and, or they may take it home, you know, if it's a tutoring mm -hmm. student, they may take it home and need to read it two or three times before they come back to me. Yeah. Um, if it's my own child, you know, I may just pick up the next session and have them read it again. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's one thing. Um, Yes, sight words, accumulating sight words, and also sight phrases. So again, on fcrr.org, they have um, in the, I think the first, second, or the second, third grade, and the fourth, fifth grade, they have sight word phrases. And so there are some, there's an area, I think, marked fluency activities. And so there's all kinds of things in there that are wonderful. But um, these sight phrases will be things that you would see a lot um, in when you're reading 
whether it's a book or whether it's directions to something, um, it might say what time is. And then another saying might be, um, and that's a good one you just pulled up. That's not the one, but keep it up there because okay. yeah. that's a really good one. Um, but yeah, so there might be just a lot of different three word phrases that you would do on flashcards, just like you would do just mm. a single word, sight words. Um, okay. That one is really, um, I love that one. And there's a, so there's a lot of those on that website. And then there's a whole book called Reading Pathways that also has those. So basically the top line, if you want to scroll up a little bit um, or scroll down, I guess, you'll see the top line has just one word and then it adds a word each line until you get a whole sentence at the bottom. Uh huh. And so, um, and this um, same thing with this Reading Pathways book and it'll have like, you know, it has the same exact kind of thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they are, they know those words really well by the time they get to the bottom line because they're only adding one word each line and they're rereading a whole lot of those same words. Um, So that's a way to work on fluency. Timed readings. um, There is uh, a website uh, which is uh, easycbm, www.easycbm.com that I use. Now that you can get a free account on that but or you can subscribe to it but you can yep. time their yeah you can time their reading um i would say no more no more often than every two weeks but you time them and you can see how they progress in their fluency and there's one minute timed readings and then one minute timed sight words and you'd have to sign up for an account in order to really see what it's got in there but Trust me, it's a really good, especially because it's free. And CBM stands for curriculum based measurement. So basically what it does is it teach it does it on grade level skills. But at the end of the it tells you what the end of the year skills are. It tests them on the end of the year skills. So you're testing them all throughout the year on what they should know by the end of the year. And so you should see an upward trajectory throughout the year. Um, but it also it I don't necessarily look at it that way as much as just kind of getting an idea of is there progress being made so there's fluency right. passages mm-hmm. comprehension passages there's quite a few different things there's math on there too hmm. so um so i think that's a really great one um yeah so those are just a few things but the key to fluency is the major key is having them read a lot reread the same material and reading mm-hmm. on their level not above it. So what you're saying is, you know, those library books that our kids want to read over and over and over again, that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Even if it drives us crazy. <laughs> as long as they're reading it over and over again, it won't drive, you know, if you're reading it over and over again, it'll really drive you crazy. <laughs> well, <yes. laughs> but, you know, you bring up a good, good point because with a library book, you know, you want to have what's called the five finger rule. And um, mm-hmm. basically if you're looking at a book, if, if they're trying to pick out a book, if they make five errors with on the first page or paragraph, mm. that book is too high for them. So oh, they need to be, tip. yeah, they need to be reading a just right book. Mm-hmm. Yes, they need to be challenged to learn to read a higher level, but when they're reading mm-hmm. on their own, they to develop fluency, let them read at or below their reading level. I was going to ask about that, you know, and Mm -hmm. and should we encourage that? And I think that's something that I did. I would always give my children audiobooks if if they wanted Mm -hmm. to hear a story or do the read out louds for the things that that they wanted to hear that they weren't ready to read um, because I wanted them to love the literature. It wasn't exactly. about pushing the writing or the reading um, because mm-hmm. that would come eventually. And I think if I had that long term goal and knew that it was coming, that I wouldn't yeah. squash those efforts through my pushing in the exactly. process. And you can also have them listen to an audio book while they're reading the written copy. Yes, and, and Kindle does a great job with that too. Now they have a text to read where you can read along with it. Um, mm-hmm. So there's lots of different technology that offers help with that. But yeah, exactly. that's that helps them learn the words, even if they, because I I think I, all children do this is you know you get to those you you're, you're reading and you just skip over the ones you don't know and you kind of fill in the gaps with with what you thought it said. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. But that is a good comprehension strategy, believe it or not. Yeah. And so are we done talking about fluency? Are we going to move on to comprehension? Because I well, know that um, I, we have some yeah. questions, but I definitely don't want to rush you on that because I want to make sure you can get in everything that, that you wanted to talk about too. Right. I do want to make sure there are a few um, things that I would like to point out um, that I think are very important because you don't get comprehension if you don't have fluency. Mm -hmm. That fluency is the greatest mm -hmm. barrier to comprehension. Obviously, mm -hmm. A lot of kids can listen and have good comprehension, but to actually yeah. read it and comprehend, you have to have fluency. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, a few things I would say. I real there's a couple of um, uh, one of the programs that I really like, and you do have to pay for it, but it's Reading A to Z, and um, and that's too. yeah, it's Reading A to Z dot com, and it is so thorough to me in how it teaches, and you have to print the things off. So, you know, there's a bit of a paper cost there plus a, plus a subscription cost, but it is the best, um, most comprehensive reading program that I have been able to find. And so basically what it does is it gives a little booklet, which I actually have, it has these little booklets and, you know, it has something on, that they can read on their level. Mm -hmm. And then it has all kinds of worksheets, what it calls worksheets to go with it. And it has the teacher instructions. But these worksheets mm -hmm. are not your typical worksheets. They're activities. So okay. you multi-sensory, multi yes. So there's you're exposed to all the words in the book through these mm -hmm. activities and, you know, maybe creating them, recognizing them on site, sounding them out, all these things before you get to the book. Wow. And then okay. so your child and so it, interacts with them and has an experience with them. So when yes. they get to the book, they don't seem like an oblivious thing. <laughs> right. And th this goes all the way up through fifth grade for a typical wow. child. So there are wonderful texts that you can download that you can work on fluency with, mm -hmm. um, but also comprehension. Um, so there's all kinds of great topics in there. I mean, there's hundreds of books available wow. and you can gauge your child's reading level. It has assessments in there where you can mm -hmm. gauge their reading level and then you can assign books to them or you can, you know, you can just print them up for them. And mm -hmm. this website actually, it's part of learning A to Z and they have all different kinds of things, but they also have one called Raz Kids, which is it has a lot of the books. It reads them out loud to them. Same books. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a really, a really good website. But there are other programs out there that are good as well. Um, I would say um, a few other tips I would want to bring in would be to teach word families. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're when you're teaching phonics word families and have them spell the words, use the same words for spelling as they're learning for reading. Because when you can put those two together, uh, right. you're going to get more bang for your buck. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another one. And then um, I guess I didn't really mention what fluency actually is, but that is reading at the right rate with the right inflection, pronunciation and accuracy. So, mm -hmm. you know, we think, oh, fluency is being good at reading. Well, it is because a good reader would do all of those things, right? Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, that. so those were, those were a few things. The other thing I would say when you're trying to develop sight words or vocabulary words or any list of words, spelling words, eight at a time, and that is the max. And if you, if they, you know, if the next session they've mastered four of them, okay, you can pull those out and give them four new ones, but keep the four old ones there. And right. no penalties, you know, no penalties mm -hmm. for not getting them. Um, you know, your child is going to read. They're going to want to read. If they're resisting reading, it's because it's very difficult, but it's not because they don't want to read. Right. And so make it as um, non-punitive and as enjoyable as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. And I'm, I'm glad you gave a definition to that, too, because I mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's it is oblivious. Like you said, you know, well, they must be they're a good reader. And we don't think about those components that all added together make right. someone fluent. And 
So, um, but yeah, that, that would make sense that fluency leads into comprehension because it's, mm -hmm. if we're struggling from one word to the next and we're stopping in the middle, the whole meaning of that sentence and that paragraph can change. And then we aren't going to understand what is actually the context that we're reading. Right. Exactly. Very difficult to do. So, um, so you have some some resources. I, we have a question too about comprehension. But before we get to that, there there was one um, question. I'm not sure if you can answer, but Amy asked if you have any tips for helping a child yeah. track across the page. Okay. Well, one thing I would say is take a like when I'm working with kids, I put my finger across where they're supposed to be reading. I just point mm -hmm. to each word when they're at first having a hard time, but I would also take a piece of a sheet of paper and put it underneath the line that they're reading and they can move it down each line. Some people benefit from actually using a colored overlay, which you can order special colored overlays or you can take um, any kind of colored paper and put it over top or not paper, but um, see through whatever you call that plastic and yeah. yeah, and put that over top and experiment with different colors because mm -hmm. some, mm -hmm. Some people will find that that's very helpful. Others, they don't see any difference at all, but it's worth checking into. But definitely putting something underneath the lines as they're reading them can be very helpful. Right, because it's it's so easy to jump lines, and especially if you have a child yes. who has, does have tracking issues already, um, mm -hmm. or if they, they tend to have ADHD and their eyes are everywhere and they don't stay yes. on page. Um, so that's a very good point. Um, but yeah, even with your finger too, because that's, that's a way to prompt them to that page mm -hmm. if they tend to, to get distracted from it. So great tips. Um, so, so, Super Nance asks, um, any tips for children who struggle with comprehension? So I know that is our, our next topic of, of yes. conversation. And I'm sure that, um, you know, this is kind of the accumulation of, of everything reading right. and where we want to get our child to. So, um, so yeah, we'll so, well, comprehension is simply understanding what you read, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I guess I would, would also check what is their listening comprehension because, you know, those things can be tied together, but they're not always. Some, mm -hmm. some people can listen and take it all in, but they just can't read it. And if that's the case, it's probably a fluency issue. Mm -hmm. But as far as a comprehension for somebody who's fluent, um, there are some strategies. So, Great. The first thing I would say is um, narration or summarizing is a good, both an assessment and a strategy because you don't know if they don't comprehend it, mm -hmm. if you don't know what they think that they heard. And so if you have a, if you're, you know, if you have a curriculum where your child is having to answer questions and they're getting the questions wrong a lot of the times, mm -hmm. There could be a variety of reasons for that, mm -hmm. but you want to tease out what are they really getting? So they should be able to summarize what they read. Mm -hmm. If they mm -hmm. can't, then there can be a variety of, of reasons why. Um, so the one thing that you, that good readers do. So there's a few things that we say, this is what good readers do. So their comprehension strategies. One is making, basically making a movie in your mind. So mm -hmm. even if you've been reading for a long time and you're a really good reader, you probably are even unaware that you do this. But if you think about it, if you've read a book or if you've just read something and it talks about a person in there, you probably create a mental picture of that person. Have right. you ever gone to a movie and you're like, no, they're not supposed to look like that. If you've exactly. read the book. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that it means that you've been making pictures in your mind and you know, you're probably picturing things that are not necessarily like, for instance, I have a student that I'm working with who has a who is on the autism spectrum. So when he, when I've asked him, I first asked him to start picturing things. I say, how do you picture this? How do you picture that person? How do you picture? Mm -hmm. He was picturing everything exactly like it was in his world. So like the kitchen, 
look in this one passage looked like his kitchen and the mother mm -hmm. looked like his mother and everybody. Okay. But typically if we're really a mature, good reader, we're going to picture different things for different mm -hmm. people. It's mm -hmm. not going to be, we're not going to picture somebody in a book in our kitchen. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, asking them what do they picture can really be an eye opener to you as to what mm -hmm. they really have going on. And you can learn that there are things, concepts that they maybe are totally misguided on and that they have no frame of reference for. Mm -hmm. Okay. And well, that's a good point. Frame of reference yeah. is, is huge in comprehending. Yes. It is. It is. And so we can call that frame of reference. We can call that background knowledge. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to build the background knowledge for the student. Like if you are pre-reading what they're reading, which I know not everybody has time to do that. Mm -hmm. But if you're pre-reading what they're reading and you see that there are some things that you know they won't have any background knowledge on or not much or you're not sure, you're going to Maybe let's say it's talking about a certain area of the world. You know, you might want to get out a map mm -hmm. and show them where that is or have them look it up. You right. know, if there's difficult vocabulary, you're pretty sure they don't know. You may want to have them look it up or you may mm -hmm. want to just tell them this is what this means. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those or if there's something, let's say that you're reading a, a historical fiction and there's something in there, you know, well, they don't, they wouldn't have a clue what that reference is, what mm -hmm. that means mm -hmm. because it's no longer relevant in our culture. Right. You know, you may want to set that up for them because that can really help um, aid in the comprehension. Um, so those are some things. Good readers make predictions. So mm -hmm. when you're saying, you know, when you finish a chapter of a book, and you have to put it, you have to close the book and you're like, oh man, I got it. I can't, I don't know what's going to happen yet, but I bet this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. That's mm -hmm. a prediction. Well, people who have struggled with comprehension don't necessarily make predictions of what's going to happen really? next. Yes. So then you've got to prompt them. Well, what do you think is going to okay. happen next? Mm -hmm. And sometimes, and the point is, it's not right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Good readers make mm -hmm. predictions, but we don't always get them right. If we did, why would we read it? Right? right. Exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, making predictions is is um, one of those traits of a good reader. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it may be what do you think is going to happen next? Or how do you think so and so is going to react when they find out that this happened? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Those kinds of things. Um, another uh, another thing that needs to happen and this can happen even in preschool is sequencing. So, you know, they have those little sequence cards that you can get for little kids, right. put these in order of the way they should happen. And it's like, you know, the two pers person brushing their teeth and, you know, you've got a different scene on each card or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's sequencing. But, you know, as they get older, even they should be able to tell you back what happened in the right order. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that's another thing. When, especially when you're looking at nonfiction, main idea and details. So, and this is a really tricky one for a lot of people. Um, so you got to find what is the main idea of this paragraph? And then what are just the details? Mm -hmm. So all the details should point to the main idea. So if they come up with a detail being the main idea, you go, okay, so what are all the details? Okay, do all of these tie into that one that you just gave me and they'll be like, no. Okay. Then let's figure out what they can all point to. And that's the main idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I even know women that struggle with that because I'm a precepts leader and you know, when we go into the lessons, I'm like, so what was the main idea? And they're, they're all, you know, they have different answers and nobody can quite agree. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> right. so it's, it's a difficult thing when you, when you deal with a text, you know, especially the Bible. Um, right. And it's a, because it's written, you know, in a language that we don't read and then translate it. And um, so, so yeah, getting our, our children to even just understand those simple paragraphs, it's a complex um, process that you, it really is. You almost break down, but it's depending on how the writer writes, you can pull details from different places in the paragraph. There's no set rhyme or reason as to how, you know, you can approach it mathematically or, you know, with some sort of formula. Right. And a lot of people think the main idea is the topic. 
Mm. And, you know, no, not necessarily. The topic might be cars, but, you know, the main idea might be, you know, cars are a type of vehicle. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, that's a, kind of a silly one, but, you know, it could be. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, finding those, finding that main idea and those details, that's really important in nonfiction reading. Yeah. Um, f- fact versus opinion is another one. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, getting them, sometimes it's hard to, for people to know the difference. Uh, especially mm. if it's an opinion they agree with, then they might feel it's a fact. Fact, yes. But probably the biggest, most difficult concept to get, it would be inferences. And so an inference is a conclusion reached on the basis of evidence and reasoning. Mm. So it's not something that's right there in the text. It's something you have got to dig out and, and come to that conclusion in your own mind of what is going to happen. Like, for example, everybody got put their, you know, everybody opened their umbrellas as they walked outside. Okay, Mm -hmm. well, we can infer that it was raining, right? But it didn't, it didn't explicitly state it. But obviously, Mm -hmm. when it gets to be a little more higher level, that can be a little more difficult to tease out. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So we don't, yeah, so then even looking for words in the paragraph it doesn't mm-hmm. doesn't compute that that's not where the, the the thing that we're looking for the topic is exists right yeah. and you particularly have struggles with inferences with um people on the autism spectrum Mm -hmm. because they tend to be black and white, very concrete thinkers. And so if it doesn't say it, it's not, it's not a thing. Right. Right. And so (laughs) they can see that, you know, you can see that in the way that they have a hard time understanding social cues, but you can also see it in the reading. So, and also, you know, sometimes ADHD, you might have trouble with it as well. Um, And different, and some people just have trouble with it. But if you're dealing, Mm -hmm. if you have a student that's on the spectrum, just keep in mind, reading comprehension is probably going to be difficult if it's not nonfiction. So mm-hmm. fiction mm-hmm. is very difficult for a lot of people on the spectrum, and they don't see a lot of need for it unless mm-hmm. it, they tend to have an obsession with that particular character or genre or something like that. But making those inferences is going to be a real mm-hmm. struggle. But it's not mm-hmm. impossible. Yeah, I think, you know, like you had talked about, you know, those discussions, slowing things down. I think that my, mm-hmm. my oldest is, was um, diagnosed with, with Asperger's, so um, mm-hmm. high functioning on the spectrum. And, um, you know, he, yes, he, he saw just the black and white of it. But when you started mm-hmm. asking him questions and he started thinking about it, he could answer them. But you, you did have to prompt to yes. get into that place. And, you know, he'd listen to yeah. those stories over and over again. And I think, you know, um, that re- repetition that we were talking about is oftentimes mm-hmm. when you allow your child to do that, that that's where they pick up the details is when they repeat and they, they find themselves mm-hmm. comfortable. In right. This. And it gives such a great platform to talk about a lot of life skills issues as well. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, because you can find so many things in reading that will present situations that they're not going to run into in in real life or that Mm -hmm. they haven't yet, but they may later on. And so hopefully they can transfer that scenario over to a real Mm -hmm. life scenario Mm -hmm. when it happens. But you can expose your children to so much more, so much of a broader palette with reading. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. And they can, it allows them to be somebody they're not to, you know, mm-hmm. and um, to, to live outside their skin. And, the, uh, you know, there's just so much joys to reading. We, we've had a couple blogs on our, our website where some of our team members have written about that. And I um, can't remember, they quoted, I can't remember, I think it's Chesterton. Um, and just, uh, no, it was, uh, C.S. Lewis talks about, you know, just the how wonderful stories are for children and just building their character and allowing yes. them to, to, to fight those battles before they have to fight them and um, learning how to respond properly and in a, in a godlike manner. And exactly. Through those, those, um, those choices that they have to make, like you said. Mm-hmm. Um, I have this book I would love to recommend to anybody who has a struggling reader. 
-hmm. and it's called Thank You, Mr. Falker. It's the, it's by Patricia Polacco. She's written a lot of wonderful children's books and she's one of my favorite children's authors, but it's basically her story. She had dyslexia mm -hmm. or has dyslexia, but she, um, she has a whole series of books about how teachers kind of impacted her and changed her life. But she grew up to be an author and illustrator. And so, you know, that can be a great inspiration. So and um, yes, line. and it is it has this story read aloud um, and you can see the book, you know, you can see the book on there, but also it's read aloud. And there's all kinds of read aloud books on there, but I have a hard time getting through reading it without crying. So I like to show it on, Aww. on storyline, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, yeah, so that's a great way to expose your kids to books, but if they do struggle, you know, that's a good, that's a testimony of somebody who succeeded. Thomas Edison, you know, is another one. And there's so many other famous people in history that did struggle with reading and with other learning challenges and, but they persevered. And so persevering through a struggle mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. can make your child stronger and um, make them more able to handle challenges in life as they get older as well. So, you know, oh, and realize that like, if you were to read a book like that, that they're not alone also, you know, mm -hmm. exactly. So they, they share the struggle. Now you've talked about storyline. This is another resource that you shared with me. What is yes. this? Okay, so Storyline, it has all kinds of wonderful children's books, and they're read aloud by famous people who mm -hmm. kind of share at the beginning what they like about the book or whatever, but then they are a personal connection, and then they read it. And um, it's just a lot of delightful stories on there, mm -hmm. and it's a great way to allow your children to get some more reading time in or get read aloud to as well. Um, and they so add new the titles as they, if they, they do. And awesome. Yeah. So the pages are what you see, you know, you see the, the person who's going to read it, they kind of, you see them at the beginning, mm -hmm. but then the pages come up full screen. And so it's not like the person holding it and reading it. It's mm -hmm. like they come up full screen and then you just hear them reading it. And everybody who reads on there, I think is, reads it very well. Good. So, so you get the fluency as well as the, <laughs> exactly. Oh, it's mean. Great. So I think you had some other resources here. I'm trying to pull up the list again. Um, Reading Rockets. Yes. So there's, you can sign up for that as well. It's free, um, but they have a lot of information as well as passages and that you can use um, lesson plans and things like that <laughs> for reading. Okay. And um, so that, yeah, I, they have, and for research and strategies, they have a lot of good stuff too. Great. So that's one. Mm -hmm. And then Hubbard's Cupboard is another one. Yes. So they have uh, free phonics readers and lessons on there. Their lessons are pretty short, hmm. but they are typically, and I have, I have some other stuff right here I can show you, but they are, and they have spelling and different things too, but some of their stuff you have to pay for. Um, but like you can print out a little reader or you can just print out a one sheet like this, which I prefer cause I don't want to print it. I don't want to use as much paper mm -hmm. and ink and all that. But, right. um, so this is, you know, in my hat and it's got the, the bat sat in my hat, the mat sat in my hat. I mean, it's kind of silly, but it also has with that, like this at word maker. Uh, so you can put different letters with the at, and then it's also got this, the sight words that are going to be in that lesson. And then another practice where you cut out the letters at the bottom and, or you could just write them next to these to make the words. And then it's got a list of huh. words. And then this is the, the lower level of the at family, but then it'll have like blends like scat and you know things like that it'll have another level that you can go a little bit higher with yeah the blends on either end okay. yeah so i mean they've got a lot of word families and so it's a great free resource that's out there yeah definitely that's lots of good things for parents to use um, mm -hmm. and i think oh yeah word ladders um, you had mentioned that. I have that. I've got the Amazon links to those, but basically this is a second to third grade word ladder book. 
And you can kind of see on the cover what the gist of it is, but it starts down here, like this is the word team, and then it gives you a clue, and it says food that comes from animals, rearrange the letters, and so then it goes meat. So you're using the same letters. Mm -hmm. And then it says not wild, a house pet is, and then it's got a, and then it says rearrange the letters again, and that's tame. And then by the time you get up to the top, it's a, you got to the word work, but you've changed either one letter at a time or you've rearranged letters and they kind of go together because team is the bottom word and work is the top word. So they teamwork. So, but you know, this is fluency. Um, it's spelling, it's vocabulary, it's all different kinds of skills. And it's really a fantastic resource. So how long would a lesson take for a student to do in, in that book just or how a word just letter. A single? Page? It depends on the student, but I would say probably no longer than 10 minutes. Okay. And if they need help, like some sometimes the, the clues may be too high for them to read. So I would read mm -hmm. that to them mm -hmm. if needed. And I would have them sound out as many of the words as they could, but I'd read to them and help them out because my main focus is not that they read the clues but that they work with those words exactly that's a very good point so yeah um yeah okay. Let's see if there was any any others that yeah oh equipping minds equipping minds um and we've interviewed uh, dr carol brown before so okay i really like her awesome. and yeah. the cognitive training um that they do I have seen my students make progress in reading by doing the cognitive training exercises. So they're game based, they're fun, um, and but they work. So I would definitely, you know, look at investing in that their in their program or learning more about it because yeah, it helps with processing and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're one of our partner organizations, so you can even okay. find them on our website. So yeah. Carol's okay. been, been awesome. I know one of our team members is starting her program, so I'm excited to see um, some changes in her daughter. She's already seen amazing changes already in just starting mm -hmm. um, the preliminary stuff. And Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer in it. Um, yeah. So I think that was all the resources that I had as far as websites. I would say another good phonics program is Explode the Code. And oh, I love um, Explode the Code. Mm -hmm. That is definitely for somebody who is struggling because some if you're an if you have an intuitive reader, they will probably get bored of it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And, and um, but if they really need a lot of practice, I think Explode the Code is is excellent. Yeah, that my boys went through their, that whole series, and it it did mm -hmm. it, it helped break things down. And for me, who never learned phonics, um, <laughs> it helped teach me too, because I had no yeah. idea what I was doing. <laughs> right. Yeah, and a lot of and and I think a lot of parents do find themselves in that position of mm -hmm. not having learned phonics, and so yeah, that so it is it it, it does put it step by step, really, yeah. really basic and good. Very very simple and easy to understand. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Well, we just have a, a couple minutes left. I want to show everybody your site as well. Um, a plus education solutions. Um, let me see if I get that up here. And so um, what can you tell us about the services that you offer and to homeschooling families? Yes. Um, so I, um, I offer quite a few services. I, like I've already mentioned, I do do tutoring in a variety of subjects, but I also do assessment. So mm -hmm. if you're interested in finding out what your uh, child, where your child is cognitively and also um, mm -hmm. what they've achieved, you know, that kind of thing, I can do that kind of assessment. And I do consulting. So if you need to develop a homeschool plan or to figure out what's going on with your child or that kind of thing, um, I do that as well. And um, sometimes I offer classes and I do speaking engagements. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the main things that I tend to do are the assessments, the consulting and, um, and the tutoring for now. So more coming, <laughs> more coming, more to come. But we'll, we'll definitely yeah. keep keep a watch on that and and let our viewers know or let people know on our our site if um, mm -hmm. you're going to be adding anything new. So that'd be great. Well, and I have a decent amount of articles on there about homeschooling wonderful. as well. So mm -hmm. 
they want yeah, to just I go there and see what they learn. Great. And that yes. is um, your website is a plus education solutions.com. So. It's actually education all solutions, but it's, uh, yep. yes. Um, so I had a little name change that I couldn't change my website name. So yeah, a plus education all solutions.com. Okay. Yes. Good to know. All right. Well, it looks like that's all the, the questions we've had. And um, so I just want to thank you for all this insightful information, Heather. It was this was really awesome. I wish this stuff, you know, I think we both look back and say, I wish I would have known this when we started homeschooling. <laughs> right, exactly. So there's so many resources now for parents. And I'm, unfortunately, it becomes overwhelming. But I'm glad that um, we can kind of bring the best of the best onto our, our show. And um, I definitely think that um, you shared some really, really key things about um, teaching your child to read tonight. And to just thank you for your time and sharing your wisdom. It's been a, a pleasure to host you. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure to be to be on your program and, and an honor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so just to let our viewers know, um, next week, Ken Zach is going to be on our show. He does experiments, science experiments on um, YouTube, and um, he's going to be sharing science experiments that encourage curiosity with us next week, which I'm super excited about because I have a degree in physics and I love doing science experiments. So <laughs> that's going to be very fun. Um, so until next week, we will... Um, We'll see you back here for that. But um, you can check us out on our website at spedhomeschool.com. And this program was funded in part by Learning Disabilities Foundation of America and by viewers like you. And if you'd like to make a donation to, to keep our ministry going, um, you can do so on our website at spedhomeschool.com also. Otherwise, we're keeping the conversation going all week long on our Facebook support group, which has almost 1.5 thousand members now. So that's very exciting. Um, so we'll see you next week if we don't see you in the group. Bye and have a good night.